Now we will start our invited talks. Uh, Professor Saif Islam will moderate the talk. Uh, I would like to invite him to the stage. Distinguished researchers. Uh, first, uh, let me uh, express my sincere gratitude and thanks to the organizers for uh, organizing this conference in such a nice sort of front, uh, beautiful hotel. Uh, with, uh, all these are uh, invited uh, and uh, uh, great uh, talks that uh, we we'll put together for the next uh, three days. We will uh, have uh, two distinguished uh, researchers. Uh, one from uh, Germany, the other one from uh, USA. We'll start with Professor Winfred Wong, uh, who is currently a faculty, uh, a professor in physics in University of Duisburg. Forgive me if I didn't say it correctly. And his uh, title is One on the Band Structure Lineup at Sharkey Context <coughs> and the Vegas Conscious. Professor Wong received his star. Uh, <coughs> Rare Nat degree, which is equivalent to Doctor Degree's degree from University of Gothenburg in 1961, and uh, his uh, research focuses on uh, semiconductor surfaces and interfaces. Oh, is it? Are we going to start with Professor Tung first? So let's wait a little bit for Professor uh, Wong. We'll start with Professor Raymond. Professor Raymond, turn. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, he's from City University of uh, New York, and uh, he'll be talking about quantum aspects of Sharkey barrier formation. Let me introduce you also a little bit in a minute. Uh, Dr. Tung received his uh, PhD from University of Pennsylvania in physics, and uh, currently his work focuses on. Uh, fabrication, transmission, electron microscopy, and ion beam characterization, and electronic properties of metal semiconductor and semiconductor semiconductor interfaces, metallization, junctions, and defects uh, issues in sub uh, micron silicon devices. Thank you very much. Um, and good morning, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, and uh, president. <laughs> Uh, I certainly would like to thank the organizing <coughs> for making this possible for me to talk to Turkey for the first time and to visit this wonderful city and to have the great honor of delivering uh, in front of a <coughs> audience a, some of my work. Uh, today's talk will be on quantum aspects of uh, traffic barrier formation. And before I give the talk, I actually like to, uh, with the permission of the organizer, I'd like to make a Personal, I'd like to make a note that uh, this talk is dedicated to the memory of Dr. Shami Emery Oldman, who tragically passed away while pursuing a PhD degree at Brooklyn College. And here he was, a wonderful student, full of life, and he understands things well, works very hard, and he is in the uh, laboratory. And here he was at a Thanksgiving dinner at my house with other uh, graduate students as well as my, with my own family. <coughs> and uh, he's known to us as Emery, although his family calls him Shani. And here he was at a, after a PhD uh, committee meeting. By the way, he, uh, every member of the committee thought he was doing a great job and he was well on his way to a great uh, PhD. So there's no doubt that he would have gotten a PhD, a very good uh, PhD program on the project, and went on to a successful science for, uh, career in science, if his life hadn't been cut short by a very aggressive disease. And Emery left me so suddenly that I didn't get a chance to tell anybody, especially his family, that how sorry he was to have lost a great student friend. So I saw on the occasion of my giving a speech in his native country, uh, Turkey, 
I would look up his parents and get together and commemorate the brilliant yet short life of a student of mine. So I'm glad to say that his uh, family is now in the audience so I can say face to face that you had a great son, that it was an honor for me to have known him and have worked with him.
is the difference between the work function and the semiconductor electron affinity. So it is true at this stage. Now the Shaki mod theory says <coughs> that when the interface is actually formed, if this relationship is still observed, then we have what's known as the shock demand rule. <coughs> so let's see how that can happen. Now, because the band rides on the electrostatic potential, and there is the superposition principle of electrostatic potential. So if we freeze the charge distribution on both the metal and semiconductor, and simply close the gap, now the potential will be given simply by a simple uh, uh, sum of the two potential on each side. And if that's the case, then of course the shakti mod relationship will be observed. Now, what that entails is that if we keep the charge distribution frozen, in other words, we do not allow the metal and the semiconductor to interact, to have any interaction. So the shakti mod rule applies to a non-interacting metal semiconductor interface. And which is, of course, very unrealistic, as we know. When metal and semiconductor meet, some kind of interaction has to take place. So this rule is not expected to have much uh, of an impact on the <coughs> experiment we observed, uh, Shakti-Perry height. And indeed, uh, it did not. For instance, these are experimental Shakti-Perry height measurements done a long time ago on Gadam arsenide where the shaki barrier height is shown not to have a strong dependence on the metal work function. And for silicon, uh, what the shaki barrier, the shaki mod relationship would predict is a very steep line, <coughs> that dependence on the metal work function. What's actually observed experimentally is a much weakened dependence on the metal work function. Now, this very weak dependence of the shaki barrier height on the metal work function is known as Fermi level gain. And uh, the reason for the shock for the Fermi level pinning is very obvious because if the charge distributions are actually frozen, then the shock mod relationship has to be observed. Now if it is not observed, then there has to be an interaction between the metal semiconductor. So it would be necessary to include the interaction between the metal and semiconductor this due to an additional interface dipole. So this pursuit or the attempt to understand shaki height now rests on how well we can understand the formation of the interface dipole. Now how do people understand the formation of the interface dipole? Now for a very long time, uh, the formation of interface dipole has been modeled by interface state models. Okay. So these models have been the most popular shaki barrier models ever since the mid-60s. Now these are phenomenological models, especially designed to explain the Fermi level pinning phenomenon. So if the charge transfer is envisioned to be controlled by a charge neutrality level, then a negative feedback mechanism kicks in and the dependence of the shocking area height on the metal work function is weakened by a factor of S here, which depends on the gap distance as well as the uh, density of state of the interface state. Now, when the density of state, interface state is large, you can see that S becomes very small. So what will be expected experimentally is that the dependence of the barrier height on the metal work function will no longer be 1, will no longer have a slope of 1, but rather have a much weaker slope dependence. So of course this model can explain the Fermi level pinning effect. Uh, however, this model relies on specific assumptions on the formation of electronic states and metal semiconductor interfaces. Now, what are these assumptions? Well, because the dipole formation is traditional to be that due to a transfer of charge from the metal to the semiconductor or from the semiconductor to the metal. So there is a fixed distance about which this takes place. 
So the charge in the metal and the charge in the semiconductor are envisioned to equilibrium. So that brings about a dipole. So to make this model suitable for systematic analysis, one has to make additional assumptions. The assumptions in two that the diffusion of the metals used properly should be independent of the metal, of the structure, etc. And that the interface state, uh, the interface dipole is due to the charge transfer between the metal and the metal induced gap state. So this is essentially a Fermi level defect. So it's all the action is happening close to the Fermi level. And thirdly, that the interface dipole is spatially one sided because the metal is assumed to be a very large density of state and the semiconductor has low density of state. So all the charge transfer leads to is a long tail in the semiconductor with minimum penetration into the, into the metal. So as it turns out that none of these assumptions made in these models are actually in agreement with what quantum mechanically the interface state are actually formed. However, one must remember that these models are all proposed during a time when experimental picture is dominated by Fermi level pinning effect. However, as the Fermi level pinning, of course, is occurring primarily in uh, polycrystal metal swimming their interfaces without with random structure, with no uh, careful control of the interface structure. However, as our technology improves on uh, fabrication uh, and on characterization, vacuum technology, epitaxial techniques, etc., single principle epitaxial metal semiconductor interfaces became available and were uh, available for experimental investigation. And it was discovered. It was discovered that for different epitaxial orientation between the same metal and the same semiconductor, the Schacke Barrett height were actually very different. For epitaxial nickel, uh, nickel suicide and silicon 111, for instance, there's a difference between uh, type A and type B orientation of 0.14 EV. And for a third epitaxial interface, that uh, silicon 101. The difference between that Schaffi height and the type B nickel suicide on one, one is as large as 0.4 EV. And the difference in depend the dependence of the barrier height on epitaxial orientation has been theoretically verified in ab initio calculations. Indeed, type A should be lower than type B by about 1.14 EV. And there are additional experimental evidence done on single crystal metal semiconductor interfaces that show a clear dependence of the Schottky barrier height on the interface structure. So experimental picture has changed. There is a very significant dependence of the Schottky barrier height on the atomic structure of the epitaxial metal semiconductor interfaces. So this Schottky barrier height mechanism is not true. Now, if you begin to think that the Schottky barrier height depends on the interface structure, and we now reconsider polycrystal metal semiconductor interface, at which the interface structure has to vary from place to place. So you can imagine that the Schottky barrier height must be varying locally from region to region. So whatever is represented by a single dot on these plots actually represent a range of barrier height. And what is being measured is only a statistical average of a range of shock barrier height. Once you realize that, then you know that Fermi level pinning is not a good, good way to describe, to describe these uh, experimental findings. What is more important is to understand why the barrier height depends on the interface structure. So for that, we have to go into little detail of how quantum mechanical interface states are envisioned before. 
Now, if we're ever talking about the electronic state of any system, that means we have to solve uh, uh, we have to solve Schrodinger's equation. So, in either the Hartree-Fock formalism or in the uh, EFT uh, with uh, Kongshen formalism, we're talking about solving a single electron <coughs> Schrodinger's equation with a potential. Now, if we are interested in electronic states in the interface, this potential has to represent the metal semiconductor interface. To construct this potential, we can imagine forming, bringing two crystals, a metal and a semiconductor together, and has to terminate or face sharply at a boundary. So this boundary separates a metal crystal from a semiconductor crystal. Now, for analysis purpose, we can assume an artificially there are two boundaries which separate the interface region from a region of metal. So outside of this region, metal is just like metal. So the bulk band would prevail. So in these regions, what uh, is uh, calculated for the bulk metal has to be the electronic solution to the wave function. Now for the semiconductor, the same uh, thing applies. So these are all states for the semiconductor side. Now inside this region, this what they call interface specific region, of course the potential is very different from either that of the metal or the semiconductor. Now for, so there's no more longitudinal symmetry to rely on or periodicity to rely on. However, there's still infinite in plane symmetry, so we can assume the potential to be two dimensional periodic. If that were the case, then the potential inside this region can be expanded in a Fourier transform of all the spa available spatial frequency. Of course, in theory, this, uh, this series, this sum has no limit. It should go up to as high a k vector as possible, but in practice, in practice, because uh, the finer detail, spatial detail, really do not matter. So we always cut off this uh, sum at a finite term. Let's say there are n term in the expansion of the potential. Now, the, uh, once we have this potential, it does the wave function. The all the periodic potential has also followed block theory. That in two dimensions, it has to have a spatial frequency allowed by block condition. So we can write what the uh, electronic state must have uh, in that it must have individually characterizable k parallel vectors. Now both with both the potential and the wave function expressible in uh, Fourier transform, we can uh, uh, plug both of these into the equation and after that we get a coupled equation. We actually get the n of this one for each uh, uh, Fourier component. <laughs> now, what is considered a solution to this problem is when all the expansion coefficients here are known. Now, how do we get expansion coefficients? We get them by fitting them at boundaries to either the bulk state of the metal or actually fitting them to both the bulk state of the metal and the bulk state of the semiconductor. So we go through this uh, boundary condition that uh, matching both the slope as well as the value of each Fourier transform at these boundaries, then if things work out fine, then we'll get a solution. So how does this work? So we actually go through this for a particular energy and k para. So for a specific energy and k para, is there a solution? That is the question. And the answer here is as simple as let's count how many conditions there are. So for that purpose, I over superimpose the bulk bed of the bulk bed of metal, which is shown in gray, and the bulk bed of semiconductor, the two-dimensional bed together, and point out that there are different scenarios we have to consider. So there could be places where there's only uh, bulk band in the metal, but there's no band, there's no electronic state for the semiconductor. So in this region, 
then we discovered that the interface solution has two n plus one adjustable parameters with which to satisfy. And there are actually two n mi minus one conditions to satisfy. So there has to be, there's always a solution. Now if we are in, in a region where there are both bulk states in the metal and bulk state in the semiconductor, when this happens, then there are two n plus one adjustable parameters, but there is only two n minus one specified condition. There are only two n minus one two constraint. So there's one additional degree of freedom at our disposal. So what that means is there we can always find two independent degenerate solutions. For uh, illustration purpose, we can imagine one of these two is a uh, incoming state from the metal, traveling state, and their scanner state into both the metal and the semiconductor. Another uh, of a uh, acceptable solution here, which is orthogonal to the first one, would be an incoming state from the semiconductor and scattering into both the metal and the semiconductor. Now, the third scenario is if we are in a region uh, in energy and in parallel, where there are no available states in either of the metal or the semiconductor. Now we're in trouble here because we have two n minus one adjustable parameter, but we actually have four n minus two conditions to satisfy. So there is a super, there is a huge over specification. So usually what this means is there are no solution unless by accident there is redundancy in the condition that is uh, that's being compared with, then, and there is an internal consistency, when that accident happens, then we may find a solution, but this has happened very rarely. Okay, so we have now, uh, have to distinguish four different uh, scenarios. So, again, I mark each metal's uh, plane as M, and semiconductor state as S. So it's possible that we have true interface states which decay into both the metal and the semiconductor. So I said already that this happens very rarely. So this happens only when there are no bulk <coughs> states in both the semiconductor and the metal. Now if there are bulk states in the semiconductor but no available state in the metal, then the semiconductor wave function has to end entering into the metal. So this decays toward the metal, and we have uh, these semiconductor state tailing into the metal. Now, most people are familiar with the third kind, which is there are states in the metal, but there are no states in the semiconductor. For instance, in the band gap of the semiconductor, we only have metal and there are no available box state in the semiconductor, then what happens is the metal state has to terminate. So somehow it has to decay toward the semiconductor. And there could be cases, scenarios set up, that the uh, electronic wave function at the interface is even more stronger, is even stronger than that inside the metal itself. Now, of course, if this happens in the fundamental gap of the semiconductor, these states are known as metal-induced capsules. Of course, metal-induced capsules cannot exist if there is no metal. So for instance, we know already that metal-induced cap states has to depend on metal. If there are no metal states at this particular energy in k parallel, there's no metal-induced cap state. So uh, it is incorrect to think that the formation of metal-induced cap state can be independent of the metal. Now, the fourth kind of state is that the both bulk state in the metal and the semiconductor. Of course, these form coupled state. Now, in ab initial calculation, there is an example of metal induced gap states calculated by these authors in uh, Texas that there is a pronounced intensity of this wave function right near the interface. So that constitutes an interface resonance. And there are also examples of true interface states in that the intensity decays toward both the metal and the semiconductor. 
So since there is a lot of interest in metal-induced capsules, so we should take a closer look at what uh, theoretical calculation shows. So I've shown here a uh, result obtained from uh, the literature that the projected density of states, point by point density of state is shown for a, a platinum to uh, STO interface. Now very high here depends on the termination with where the whether the interface begin, begins with an SRO layer or begins with a TIO layer. In this particular example, it begins with an SRO layer. And so this is the beginning of semiconductor. And here is the fundamental gap. So all these states here are metal induced gap states. However, if you look at the feature dependence, so there is a little peak here. You can also see the peak, same peak in the metal density of state, meaning that the metal new scalp state and the metal states <laughs> on the other side are part of the same state. It's, uh, there's no charge transfer to take care of part of the same state. There's no charge transfer. Without one, there cannot be the other. So and there are other features here you can identify. So there is always <coughs> one to one correspondence of feature a state then of the metal and that of the second metal. Now there's something else that we should point out is that here is another example of this layer by layer projected density of state. So this is the beginning of semiconductor and that's the beginning of the metal. So this is from a different definition from a different group. So these are metal per layer density of state. You usually think that metal there is a top is firmly like screen, so after a layer, it should be bulk metal. But look, the density of state on the first layer of metal, how different it is from the second layer, and how different it is from the third layer. So the effect of the interface actually decays quite a distance into the metal. This is completely opposite to what people have envisioned to be the formation uh, mechanism of shaft. Now to dwell on the point of the range of the interface state, we can look at a few more examples. For instance, the original result of epitax and nickel suicide, as I said, has been reproduced in calculation, which also showed that now I'm plotting either the potential of the excess charge as a function of distance into the metal and the semiconductor away from the metal semiconductor boundary. So the disturbance in the metal semiconductor interface actually rests almost equal distance into the metal, this is the metal, and that's the semiconductor. If anything, its tail into the metal is a little longer than its tail into the semiconductor. You can see another example here. This is the boundary of the metal and semiconductor. Over here is platinum, which is the metal, and out here is the semiconductor. You can see the disturbance due to the formation of interface decays quite a bit distance into the metal than it does into the semiconductor. There are other examples, for instance, these uh, authors were playing with the uh, rumbling or the buckling of the interface. They're trying to artificially change the interface arrangement of oxygen with uh, cations and see how that changes the interface. And of course, the Shakti Bera height depends on the interface structure. Whatever, whatever they do to the structure has an effect on the Bera height. But what's more important is to see that no matter what structure they assume, the disturbance into the metal, this is the metal side, is longer, or if not longer, then at least comparable to the disturbance into the semiconductor. So the formation of the interface type is rather symmetric. It's not one-sided as envisioned in the interface state models. So let's briefly review what quantum mechanically we know about the formation of the interface state. It's, uh, about, I'm sorry, the, these uh, graphics really didn't come out as brightly as on the laptop. But, so we could consider the formation of interface 
states. On the impacts of cobalt suicide on silicon 100. So first we have the bulk band mapped out for the metal and the bulk band mapped out for the semiconductor. If we overlap these bulk bands, and now this identifies all these interface states, what character they have. They belong to metal, semiconductor, both sides, or they can be truly interface state. So, the formation of the interface dipole has to be due to the spatial distribution of all of these states, not just states near the Fermi level. So, the actual ch charge transfer can be, oh, sorry, the color is really bad. The, so, you can imagine <coughs> that at some region in the energy that there's charge transfer from the metal to the semiconductor. Other regions, they are charge transfer in the other direction. And this is a very complicated process that depends on the band structure, the atomic structure. So we can summarize, and this happens over a long energy range. It's not just a local uh, range in energy that you can analyze and be able to conclude anything. So the formation of interface states depends on the atomic structure. It depends on the bank structure of both the metal and the semiconductor. And there are four different types of interface states that we can distinguish. The interface dipole is due to charge distribution over a wide energy range by all of these states. And all, every state makes a contribution to the interface dipole. And lastly, that the interface dipole extends similar depths into both uh, the metal and the semiconductor. So this is a very messy and complicated uh, scenario. And that is why it doesn't offer, even though we can understand it completely scientifically, but it doesn't help us in trying to understand the magnitude of barrier height. That's the dilemma I'm talking about here. That on the one side, we have simple models that you can use, which are not very realistic. On the other hand, we have this rigorous picture we can also use, but it's not very simple. So somehow, we have to merge in the middle. So we have to find something that is roughly accurate, roughly correct, and is approximately accurate. So that would be quantum tendency. So I'm going to get into several ways that we can use quantum chemistry to estimate the formation of interface dialogue. A few years back, well maybe more than a few years back, I had the ideas that the interface dialogue is driven by bond formation, formation of chemical bonds <coughs> and metal silicon interfaces. If that were the case, then we can use chemical methods to estimate the polarization of chemical bonds and metal secondary phase. So I went ahead and used the electrochemical potential visualization method to estimate the uh, polarization bond and interface and equate that with the interface cycle. When I did that, I came up with equations that are looking very similar to what interface phase model would predict. What's better is that these predictions actually agree with the experiments we observed, strengths of fermion of Pokini on different semiconductor very rough. So what this shows is that you don't need to have any mechanism or any assumption on the interface state. All you have to do is take care of the chemistry. So if you can understand the chemistry at the interface, then what kind of dipole would arise due to the formation of the bond? Then you can explain, explain the Fermi-Lo opinion. However, these methods that I used years ago are very crude. They're not, you cannot use them seriously to make accurate uh, prediction or analysis of actual experimental data. So we need something that's better. And we can go back and look at our original picture of what the Shaki Berry is. So if the barrier height is actually the difference between the uh, Fermi level of the metal and the valence band of uh, maximum of the semiconductor, then we can see this difference in barrier height can also be written as three terms. 
One is an internal chemical potential for the metal. The other is an internal chemical potential for the semiconductor. These two terms are pure bulk terms. They have nothing to do with interface or surface or whatever. Now, the only contribution from the interface is the is the dipole of the voltage drop due to the presence of the interface treatment. So we can now, knowing that, we can sort of break this up more uh, definitively. So we can try to reference the semiconductor band to the vacuum level, and we can try to reference the one of the metal band and the semiconductor band to the reference level, and we can find a way to estimate the dipole due to the interface. Then we have a way to sort of semi uh, uh, quantitatively predict and analyze Shakti In order for this to happen, we need to find a way to reference the bulk end of either the metal or the semiconductor to the vacuum level outside. So this requires referencing bulk end to vacuum level outside. Is there such a method? In other words, is there a pure bulk contribution <coughs> of a crystal uh, pure water potential? That is the question that has been asked many times in the literature. And there is a heated debate in the literature. The answer is now very clear. The answer is no. There is no way you can define a bulk band with respect to an external reference without actually ending the crystal somehow. So that is not realistic. What, is, what we should do is to terminate the bulk crystal structure on a, using a strategy which makes the subsequent analysis of the interface term easier and makes more sense. Now, this requires the construction of a model solid. A model solid is an artificial distribution of charge density put together by using the bulk density. So we can imagine filling uh, a lattice with a unicell distribution of charge density at every uh, lattice site. Now this unit cell density has to be chosen carefully to have no net charge, <coughs> no net potential, no net dipole, no net quadruple, etc. So that the potential outside the cell drops off uh, very rapidly. Now, that is a very uh, complicated process. Of course, we don't have time to discuss today. But suffice it to mention that, indeed, we can have different strategies to terminate the bulk, such that the band can be referred to the external uh, vacuum level. And after we do that, then for each particular choice of bulk termination, we have to use a method which compare is compatible with that for our interface analysis. Let me give you an example. So shown here is the charge distribution at a sealed charge distribution at an actual metal semiconductor interface. Now away from the sorry this is really bad it's much better on that screen. So, away from the interface where there is charge to be arranged we can identify the bulk density away from the interface. Now, if we erase all the other charges and leave only the two bulk standard here, we know at this stage the first bulk very high is given by the difference between the two bulk bands. Now, the actual very uh, high is then what this is with the addition of the term due to the presence of charge at the interface. So this is what I mean by choosing a bulk termination which makes the subsequent analysis easier, is that we can choose either to terminate the Wigner uh, site cells with half, halves of atoms from neutral uh, gas uh, phase atom. So if we cap it this way, then this is a very reasonable beginning for us to do electrochemical potential equalization methods. So we can use chemical methods to try to estimate how by equalization of chemical potential, what kind of dipole would and in it added to this bulk term will give us uh, hopefully uh, a close approximation 
of the actual Shakadara. Or we can use it completely different. We can leave the bulk termination in place and now try to figure out, using another calculation, what the interface would, the density would be in a different calculation. Let me show you how that's done. So if I'm interested in, in barrier height of um, epitaxial aluminum and zinc selenide, let's say with aluminum zinc uh, bar, interface bar, I would cut a now aluminum has a slight strength on zinc selenide. So I would call the bulk, I would cut the bulk density of aluminum ending on a <coughs> aluminum pipe. For, to represent the strain of aluminum. I would then cut a density and potential from the bulk zinc selenide ending up a zinc point to represent the zinc selenide. And for the interface, we have two aluminum atoms to every zinc atom. So I'm going to go ahead and do a third calculation of a bulk unit cell consisting of two aluminum and zinc. From that, I would cut a sliver of charge and place it right in the middle. Now, if when I stitch, I'm sorry, I will, I will, I will finish soon. Yes. So now, if I stitch everything together, what happens is the shaky height is actually estimated to be within seven mil MeV of that calculated by in a full-blown supercell calculation. So this is how chemistry can be used to simplify the job of interface type of estimation. So I actually don't have uh, time to discuss. I'm sorry, I'm a little dizzy, so I can't talk fast enough to finish this uh, talk in time. I apologize. So I would have shown you several ways that to that uh, the presence of dopant discreteness of dopant atom would have affected a potential distribution that is otherwise homogeneous, <coughs> and these would have very dramatic effect on transport phenomenon at metal semiconductor. <coughs> but unfortunately, I ran out of time, and there are things I plan to talk about nano contact, which I. So here is a summary, which uh, I can can read in the. Well, by the way, the, the talk today is based loosely on an article that I wrote that is about to come out in Applied Physics Reviews. And I thank my uh, contributors and I remind you that I'd like to very much uh, be honored of dedicating this talk to the memories of Chami and Rintoli. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Tan, for this beautiful talk. Um, I guess we should take a few questions and have a little bit of discussion, and I hope you don't mind moving the lunch break a little bit uh, by a few minutes. We have got all these great speakers here. Uh, so if you have any question, I'd like to start uh, first. So you, all your discussions focused on uh, sharp interface of metal correct, and semiconductor, right? Correct. But in real device, I guess, this metal ions probably will move back and forth uh, within semiconductor. Or semiconductor might move uh, to, to model because of solid solubility and other things. Or when you buy it, I guess, current probably also costs uh, And when you measure, I guess, they measure real device that has this kind of uh, movement of ions. Uh, are those taken into consideration? Uh, when you're analyzing realistic, I mean, Shopify diode, they can put your hand, of course, there are many, many mechanisms that actually goes on defects, feature diffusion, and formation of uh, dislocation. Six all which affect the interface distribution of uh, uh, electronic state significantly, as well as the local profile in the shopping area. Now, there are, uh, we know how to handle each one of these individually. If each one of these is presented to you in a uniform form, you know your interface is nothing but the structure. You know how to analyze it. The tricky part is always that your interface has unknown number 
of all of these parameters, which you have no way of, um, of estimating together and how one would influence the other. So it's a challenge. But having the right idea of how each individual interface helps greatly in how to understand how uh, these assorted structures when put together uh, the how you model that kind of characteristic. Any questions? It's going to be a very simple question, but uh, do you see any photoanalysis coming from those uh, metal induced states? No. No? No. I haven't. Uh, there, uh, I, I must say that the measurement, the attempt to measure metal induced gap state has been, uh, um, has had long history in the literature. Um, the model, in those measurements, the analysis model was invariably based on <clears throat> based on a model like this. You assume that there is clear separation between the state, between the metal <coughs> state and the metal, that you can investigate one without influencing the other. Quantum mechanically speaking. That is just the wrong picture. The metal induced gap state is part of the metal state. You cannot measure it without actually involving the entire metal state. So there is some question uh, to the basis of those experimental investigations. In other words, they started out probably on the wrong model. And whatever they can conclude then has to be taken with a grain of salt, so, so to speak. Any other question? <coughs> if not, I uh, thank the turn once again.